So, good morning, all. A warm welcome to INCAPS, the second Indo Norway workshop on smart sensing, communication, and machine learning for autonomous and cyber physical systems. I welcome our keynote speaker, Professor B. Yagnarayana, sir, onto the stage. And uh, I also welcome Professor uh, Michael Hansen, who is uh, 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 the Dean uh, for, of uh, University of Agder, uh, who has joined us uh, live uh, from Norway itself. And uh, also, I welcome the faculty organizing committee, uh, Professor uh, C. Lingaredi, sir, and Professor C. Krishna Mohan, sir, onto the stage and uh, begin the session. And uh, another uh, faculty organizing committee, like Professor uh, Abhinav Kumar, sir, he'll be joining uh, shortly. Yes. So, yes. So, uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I welcome, you know, uh, all of you for this, uh, you know, um, uh, workshop on uh, uh, the autonomous, uh, you know, cyber physical systems, uh, jointly conducted by, you know, uh, University of Agder and I8 Hyderabad. Uh, so, I welcome, uh, you know, Professor Agna Raina, chief guest of uh, today's, uh, uh, you know, event. And also, I welcome uh, Professor Linga Reddy, uh, University of Agder, uh, for this, uh, you know, function. And uh, I also welcome uh, uh, Professor Michael, uh, Dean, University of Agder. Uh, hello, Michael. Hello. Yeah, how are you? Fine, thank you. Yeah, nice happy to, you. to uh, see you again after a long time. Yes. Yeah. Very so, nice. So. Professor, so, thank you very much for joining. So I will, and I welcome you for this uh, event. Uh, so uh, with this, now I request uh, you know uh, Professor uh, Linga Reddy uh, to uh, give uh, you know inaugural you know uh, to this uh, workshop, inaugural address to this workshop. Thank you. Hello. So thank you, thank you for joining. Uh, so this is actually the part of Indo-Norwegian collaboration in autonomous and cyber physical systems project. So that is a long project, almost for four years. Uh, so we still have one more year left. So so this this is the second workshop. Uh, uh, then we have basically a couple of more to go. Uh, we have a broad spectrum of topics. Uh, so covering uh, all the way from the electronic systems to 
sensors to machine learning to uh, so broadly all areas of electrical and computer science engineering uh, so we basically start with the uh, the, uh, the the inaugural section uh, session uh, by professor uh, michael hansen uh, so he is the dean of electrical dean of faculty of engineering and science at the university of agder so he has a PhD degree in uh, mechanical engineering from the Aalborg University. Uh, he has supervised more than 140 master students, also more than 20 PhD students. Welcome, Michael. Uh, you, you already shared the screen. Uh, yes. Once again, welcome everyone. Michael, you can start. Now. Thank you, Linka. And. Uh, Hello to all of you. It's uh, my pleasure and honor to be allowed to help start up the INCAP Second Indo Norway workshop on smart sensing, communication, and machine learning for autonomous and cyber physical systems in SSCOM and in hybrid mode. So I would like to stress how happy both me and the faculty management in general is for this. Uh, uh, large cooperation that our faculty and our relatively young university have enjoyed over the last years with some uh, top Indian institutes. It's been my pleasure to travel with Linga uh, and visit, I think, all of uh, the institutes that we have cooperation with. And I have always been impressed with a very high quality, both among the teachers and the students and the administration and the kindness that we have always met. So I'm really delighted uh, that uh, we now have this workshop. Uh, it's based on the foundation of, of three main projects. Look at the low attitude unmanned aerial vehicle communication and tracking. That's an INTNOR, a bilateral project that has funding from both the Norwegian Research Council and the Department of Science and Technology, DST in India. We have the INCAPS, which is the main uh, host for today's workshop, the Indo-Norwegian Collaboration in Autonomous Cyber Physical Systems, which is an INPAD project, another type of research project from the Norwegian Research Council. And similar, we have the INMOS, the Indo-Norwegian Collaboration in Intelligent Offshore Megatronic Systems which is a joint collaboration by two of the departments at the, our faculty, the engineering science and information and communication technology. So a little bit about LUCAT uh, here, we have the uh, University of ACTA, the research group that the Professor Linga is leading, the autonomous uh, cyber physical systems. We have the Indian Institute of Science from Bengaluru and the Indian Institute of Technology Hyderabad. So this is on precise localization and tracking of UAVs, smart sensing and communications for UAVs. So it explores millimeter wave radars and communication, 3D spectrum cartography for GAG channels and spectrum cognizant low latency GAG communication. Very interesting projects as seen from the faculty point of view and in the core of our strategy. Here just a few maps to show a where in the south of Norway our university lie and uh, where we are in India, the IIT in Hyderabad and uh, a little bit further south, at, at least if we look at a map like this, it's just a few millimeters further down south, we have the Indian Institute of Science in Bengaluru. Um, another project I mentioned is the, uh, the INCAPS where we uh, actually have uh, the Norwegian University of Technology, NTNU, and the Norwegian Research uh, on, on Water, NIVA, as collaborators. And from India, we are happy to have the Indian Institute of Science and the Indian Institute of Technology from Hyderabad. We have the Biala Institute of Technology and Science, also Hyderabad, and the Triple IT International Institute of Information Technology, also in Hyderabad. Very important and very uh, interesting project. Similarly, we have the inmost where we have um, again partners and collaborators from Norway that wants to join us in this Norwegian-Indian uh, collaboration 
again, the Technical University of Norway, NTNU, and the Research Institute in Norse. Here we have uh, partners and collaborators from Tirupati, the Indian Institute of Technology from there, the IIT from Indora, the IIT pa from Palakkad, and the National Institute of Technology in Goa. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, really amazing to be part of cooperation with so many strong institutes. So I will not go into so much detail on the conference as such, as such the NSSCOM 2022. Uh, you can see here uh, how the three-day workshop is, is set up. Uh, I would uh, I would prefer to uh, point out uh, some of the very interesting lectures uh, and the way that it has been set up. I would also like uh, to uh, on behalf of my dear colleague, uh, Professor and Director Jorun Gislefoss from, from our faculty, she sends her regrets, her apologies and her warm uh, uh, wishes for a good workshop, but she simply lost her voice, um, literally. So uh, I was happy and honored to, to step in for her today. Otherwise, I think we can see from all three days that you have some uh, um, very interesting lectures and, and workshops set up for you. Yagna Narayana and uh, Granmo, the professors from Hyderabad and UAE, I'm uh, convinced will deliver very, very nice keynote lectures in a few minutes. And otherwise, I'm happy to see both Professor Linga and Professor Krishna Mohan, who has done, both have done a, a fantastic job in setting up the conference. So. I would like to thank those two and Professor Apinav Kumar, also from the IIT in Hyderabad. I would like to, to thank the student organizers, Divya, Sintusha, Pujita, Dr. Srinivar, Dr. Vishnu, Naveen, Wilson, and Avin. So thank you to all of you. I am convinced and I hope for you that you'll have a, a very good workshop uh, today and the next two days. And I look forward to meeting as many as possible of you physically in Grimstad for the next workshop. So very good luck with the workshop and thank you for your attention. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Michael, uh, for your uh you know, uh, introduction to the workshop and also the, uh, you know, giving uh, uh, good, uh, you know, uh, uh, information related to the Indo-Norwegian collaboration. Uh, so thank you once again, Michael. Hope uh, to see you uh, in India soon. Yes, <laughs> yeah. me yeah. too. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so now uh, 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 we'll have uh, the uh, invited, I mean, keynote uh, uh, talk by Professor Egna Raina. So, Professor Egna Raina, like, as you all know, like, uh, you know, uh, he's a stalwart in the field of uh, speech signal processing uh, in the world itself, uh, not only in India, but whole world. So, I just to try to give a brief uh, biography of Professor Egna Raina. So, uh, Dr. Baya Egna Raina is currently uh, in Saha. Uh, honorary scientist uh, and emeritus professor at Triple IIIT Hyderabad. He was a professor emeritus at Bits Pilani Hyderabad campus during 2016. He was an uh, institute professor from 2012 to 2016 and a professor and a Microsoft chair from 2006 to 2012 at the uh, IIIT uh, Hyderabad. So he was a professor, uh, you know, between uh, 1980 and uh, 2006 and head of the department of uh, computer science and engineering at iit madras and a visiting uh, associate professor at uh, carnegie Mellon university pittsburgh uh, usa from uh, 1977 to 1980 and a member of the faculty at the institute of uh, science uh, bangalore from 1966 to 1978 he received bsc from andhra university in 1961 uh, I think uh, before all of us born. Okay, so and BE, MTech, and PhD from IASC Bangalore from 1964 
1964 and 1974 respectively his research interests are in signal processing uh, speech image processing and neural network he has published over 450 papers in these areas so he is the author of the uh, book artificial neural network published by printis hall uh, of india in 1999 He has supervised 37 PhDs and 42 MS theses at IAC, IIT Madras, and Triple Eight Hyderabad. He is a fellow of the uh, Indian National Academy of Engineering, Indian National Science Academy, uh, Indian Academy of Sciences, and IEEE Fellow, USA, and International Speech Communi- uh, Communications Association, that is ISCA. He was the recipient of third IETE Professor S V C Aya Memorial Award in 1996. He received the Professor S N Mitra Memorial Award for the year 2006 from I N E E. He was awarded the 2013 Distinguished Alumnus Award from I S A Bangalore. So he was awarded the Syed Hussain Jahir Medal 2000 in 2014 of INSA. Also he received. Uh, Professor Rayas Ahmed Memorial Lecture Award from Acoustic Society of India in 2016. Further, he was an associate editor of uh, for the IEEE Transactions on uh, Audio, Speech, Language, and Language Processing during 19, uh, 2003 to 2006. From 2020, uh, he is an associate editor of the Journal of Acoustic Society of America. So he received Doctor of Science. uh from uh, jawaharlal nehru technological university uh honorary doctorate okay anantapur uh, in 2019 in february 2009 he was general chair of for inter speech conference uh, held in 2018 at iit i mean at hyderabad during uh, september 2018 he was a visiting professor at cmu africa in uh, rwanda rwanda and uh, at uh, Uh, IIT Dharwad during 2009 he is currently adjunct faculty at IIT Tirupati and distinguished professor at IIT Hyderabad and distinguished adjunct professor at Triple uh, IIT uh, NR so i think uh, uh, you know from this like it goes on you know there is no like so much to tell about professor agna raina but uh, due to the uh, time and uh, above all like He is my, you know, mentor also at IIT Madras, uh, who uh, molded, uh, you know, me and because of that I molded many of uh, the students uh, at IIT Hyderabad. So, uh, so I really thank uh, Professor Agna Raina for taking his time out in spite of his age, and uh, in spite of his busy schedule, of uh, accepting the uh, this, uh, you know, uh, to come here and give a, a keynote address. so thank you very much sir uh, for coming here and uh, i i request you to uh, please uh, give a talk thank you so this side yes, or you oh i you can see yourself is it is that what it means uh, this is for uh, this no no let it oh, what is this for online purpose online purpose oh, okay. online purpose no you need not worry about it you just uh, speak this is uh, Very good morning. Uh, it's uh, indeed a great pleasure uh, and uh, a privilege to be here in IIT Hyderabad. Of course, I'm not new to this place, and uh, it's a pleasure because I'm seeing all of you and uh, talking to you on this uh, very important workshop. <clears throat> I and Professor Krishnamohan asked me to talk the, at this workshop, and especially as a keynote speaker, I really don't know what to talk because the areas are uh, that are mentioned for the workshop 
I don't work in any of them. So I, I work in the area for speed signal processing for almost 55 years now, maybe close to 60 years. And, uh, and uh, but having said that, got the only justification probably I can claim why I could talk to uh, uh, you people at this workshop is because whether I, I, I didn't do anything uh, in AI or machine learning, but it so happens I have been very lucky to be associated over almost five and a half to six decades of people working in this area, not only in India, but abroad as well. That is the only qualification I have other than you know, to speak in front of you, not because I'm an expert here. And uh, also the, of course the organizers asked me the title, slides, and so on. I don't have any slides to talk, you know. I'm, I normally don't prepare any slides because most of the thoughts I collect while coming to the workshop. Of course, I have been preparing for what to talk about at this place for the past 15, 20 days, but I didn't make any notes or something. So please pardon me for that. You don't have this uh, uh, PowerPoint slides, which my Professor Rajaraman used to say it has only power, but there's no point. So, <clears throat> okay, let us begin. And uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, I get about how much time? Can you, can organizers tell me how much time I will get? Uh, is it about an hour? Is almost one hour. One hour, okay. Because the problem is if you don't tell me the time, I can go on till evening. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> So, uh, you see, the t all said and done, the topic I have chosen, and also I asked Professor Krishna, uh, Krishna Mohan, whom am I addressing to? He said, mostly students, of course, uh, apart from IIT known for BTEC and programs and so on, research scholars especially, and uh, so those who are working in general, many areas, and especially in the area of AI and uh, ML and so on. So I chose a topic which a topic means at least it's really not a topic. I wanted to bring out some issues which most of us, in fact, almost everyone, if I may be wrong if I don't uh, uh, in my statement, but uh, may not be even have thought about it, you okay? see? And, uh, and also it is very important to know that you have, my career is over, you see. I have retired almost 15, 20 years ago, and uh, I, I just do something like giving addresses like this, but uh, uh, but you have a career almost 30, 40 years in front of you. What is it that you do? So that is what I want to emphasize, not that the topics or the way areas I mentioned are any important, but the way to think about it is what I want you people. I say, the way to think about when you are in an academic setting like this and so on. So let us begin. As I try my best to stick to this um, domain of AI and machine learning without knowing much, but almost anything, without knowing anything about it. But uh, that's why I said beyond the AI and ML. So let me start. First few minutes will be a slightly general background what motivates me to give a talk like this or something, to choose topics like this and so on. In fact, most of the topics I mentioned are topics which all of us have to follow out, especially you people, and the light of what we are all going through kind of thing. <clears throat> An estimated 25,000 papers were written in machine learning from US alone in 2019. And now you can imagine extrapolate, that was, that was almost three, three and a half years ago. <clears throat> and uh, then what happened? What happened was immediately after 2019, January, December onwards, what happened? We are all stuck with Corona. And uh, you know, and you can see what happened, whole world has changed. And my simple complaint is, what happened to all these machine learning people? What happened to our projections and so on? What is it that we projected? Every time you project something, something unknown seemed to happen. I see. 
that hundreds and thousands of people, even lakhs of people are dying. And uh, so what is it that we are doing at Mission? When I use some of this, please take it with, uh, you know, in the proper context, don't misquote me on this, you see. We are all uh, machine learning people, so we collect the data and start projecting again what happens. So from uh, another three months onwards, another 11 lakh people will die per month and so on. That is the kind of information nobody, none of us as scientists, I'm talking about scientists, I'll also tell you what is the role of a scientist in all of this. As scientists address the problem itself, we are all worried about how to make projections on this. And what happened to all my machine learning ideas? Why is it that it could not project anything that is accurate in the last three years? And why is it in the whole world? Nobody is, we are all, of course, all great institute thinkers like me and you. We keep on writing models and projections and so on. This is what happens and so on. Give lectures like this. And people are dying on the roads. You please, why am I quoting this is? I will quote one or two such examples. Why, what we are not thinking or how the current way of thinking is inhibiting our thinking to address some realities. That's the reason. That's the reason I am quoting this, you see. And so that's what happened in that uh, uh, situation. Uh, and uh, that is in the, and let me quote, give another example. See? I usually attend some of these very interesting talks, interesting to you people as well, because last five, six, seven, eight years, brain-computer interaction. We have all heard about it, and you know, any time that is a web webinar is there, all of us, you know, lock on to this and try to listen what is it. And of course, I attended many physical lectures on this. What is it that we talk about? Yeah. It's somewhat, you see, of course, maybe youngsters like you are excited about it, but people like me are disappointed about it. Why? Why is it that I have heard at least three or four such lectures from stalwarts who are directors of brain research laboratories and so on. And every time they say, no, 100 electrodes, just some numbers, don't keep talking. 100 numbers, somebody said, no, I have 1,000 numbers of tensors and so on. Somebody says maybe 10,000 numbers. You see, June 2022, IEEE spectrum. The cover page shows how many electrodes latest has and so on. And then, what is it that you do? Please understand the statements carefully so that it makes the, uh, my message clearer probably as we go along this one. What happened? You collect, let us say, some number, n. It's not one or two, thousand, hundred, thousand, doesn't matter. Any number of zeros you can have. You collect the signals. Then what? You collect the signals, and then you do some averaging on that because all the signals look nice. And afterwards, what do you do? And then you do some kind of a feature extraction out of this. What is that feature extraction? Those of you in signal processing, you will know signals in general and signal processing and speech in particular. There's what's called MFCC, malfrequency capsule coefficients. I don't really know who invented that. You see, I was one of the first of you to read that paper when, before it was published in 1978 when I was in US. You see, and so they extract that from this as feature vector. And then follows what? Machine learning, support vector machine. A support vector machine and then classification, some tables come, you see. And then this percentage, my number is better than yours. If you don't have state of the art, you create one. And then compare this, my number is better than yours. And then that up to that, I am okay. I have no problem. But the last two slides of this is most irritating for me, but not for you people. Because you will all, you are all researchers, you get so attracted by that. What the, oh, now this analysis, this interaction will solve Parkinson's problem, cancer, uh, you know, uh, um, art, uh, arthritis, everything that you, that I can hear in medical, this one, it solves. That is the concluding uh, slide of that. What is that? It's going on. Even in June 22nd spectrum issue that is there, that statement is there. I'm not saying we should not do this research. All I am trying to say is, what is it that my male capsule coefficients are doing? It has already destroyed the information that you want to extract. And now you have a great support vector machine 
and all of us think that support vector machine is a machine learning tool and so on. There's no learning in support vector machine. Please note that. Okay. So that is the second example where why is it that I am good? First one is a social impact on the society as a whole. The second one is an impact on scientists, researchers like you. What do you, why, what do you mean by impact? If you don't, if it's okay, it's okay if we take a balanced view of that, but we don't. Then immediately, including me, please don't think that I am isolated from this. Oh, I should enter this area. I should do brain computer interaction. I should impress people like Krishna Mohan and others. I am doing work in brain computer interaction. So you'll immediately take you for your PhD or something. Other. This is exactly what happens without knowing what is it that has been reported. Then the third example. Third example. All. This is all because if uh, the input that is given by Krishna Mohan that I should, I am addressing students and especially research scholars. If there are senior faculty, and very kindly ignore my words. Okay. <clears throat> Third example. Just about a few years ago, about four or five years ago, I heard it at a AI workshop in uh, Gachupoli, and uh, I know being senior, grey head and so on, you know, retired person, everybody invites me to sit in the front chair and so on. The whole hall was filled with about five to seven, eight hundred people. And uh, even the front row cannot hear anything because that is how the uh, uh, acoustics of that room was. But there was a talk by a person, by a director of Facebook, some machine learning, this one. And he presented a talk where I may be wrong in some zeros, please ignore that. He said million, maybe 10 million or a billion, I don't know, images. And he processed image recognition and so on. And finally, you know, uh, gets a percentage with a bold number better than the other numbers. And uh, of course, I'm looking at all angles and so on. And I'm a very careful listener in all of this. The people at the back, students mostly, because the whole hall was full. And some of them, at the end of the talk, no, I don't know anybody. And in fact, other than some organizers there, I was just going to my car. One of the uh, couple of the youngsters around mid 20s and said, Sir, I want to talk to you. What is it that you want? Sir, I am working in database for a company. Do you think I have a future if I don't process million images? Just to see the impact of the students or the youngsters. They say, Not that it is wrong, but what do you mean by that? They say, and that is the, and then of course, what is happening in the last uh, few years is nothing but a tragedy. You see, because not that IITs, of course, you have to have programs like this. There's no question about it because you know what you are doing. Whether it is the AIA program, ML program, or a degree program or something. But all colleges, out of 1,000 intake that they take earlier, the computer science, AI yeah, yeah, are all only 200. Now they are 800. And the remaining 200 are for civil, mechanical, electrical. There is hardly any intake. What is happening here? Even that I can tolerate. I am talking from the student's angle. Even that I can tolerate. You see? We don't have any definition for AI and machine learning. We don't have books. And we start, I was in many of those boards, and somebody I said, we are already starting AI and machine now. Our intake is full and so on and so forth. They are willing to play. Then I asked, it's a four-year program. So what are you going to do in second, third, fourth year? We have three more years. We have one year to plan for that. So first we take the students. What about faculty? We have one year to recruit the faculty. What is going on? That also is OK. Now you see. Because all of us uh, earlier, Java, C++, Python, everything was on the high-tech city, on the roads, you know, or in the biodiversity, those who belong to Hyderabad, biodiversity corner, there are advertisements. You want to be an expert in big, uh, big data? Come to us. You see? And that got slowly replaced by, unfortunately, biodiversity itself is gone, so those boards have been shifted. Shifted to, please see cyber towers. 
In fact, I, once I just got down from the metro station there, I was waiting for somebody to pick me up. And just opposite that cyber tower gate, and I saw a boat. Immediately I took my mobile and uh, took a photograph. What did I say? You want to become an expert in AI and machine learning? Come to us. What did it mean? Earlier I thought they were all doing C, C++, maybe Python. But we let that Python inside the IIT, and we let them do AI and machine learning there. Again, you may say, why am I saying this? Now the question comes, I'm sitting in many committees where I have to select people. How do I know he has got instruction from that or from IIT or from ordinary college and so on? Please tell me. I'm not painting any wrong picture here. Please, I'm only trying to see the realistic part of it. That is all the part I'm saying. And proliferation of courses. Diploma, three-year diploma, two-year diploma, four-year degree, PhD program, center of excellence, all these things have sprung up in the last four or five years. God only knows. There is not a single undergraduate book in AI till. There is not a single undergraduate book in machine learning till. Can you have an undergraduate program? No, thanks to the government, uh, enthusiastic administrators, politicians with advisors like me sitting there, you said you should start AI from eighth standard. What's going on here? Right? I know, I think, you know, basically, of course, before I proceed for the technical part of it, just tell you, this is the background which worries me a lot. Not that what is being done is wrong, but how it is projected is what is wrong. You see, that is the point I want to, and what is it that in this process we are missing is what I'm going to talk in the remaining part of this. And uh, so I have spent enough uh, on this. In fact, before I <laughs> proceed with the my understanding of the subject and what is it that is done or not done, I would like to give one small, in, not example, in an email I received a couple of weeks ago from a BTEC from IIT, one of these old IITs. The mail reads like this. Respected Professor Ignanarayana, sir. I am impressed with your profile. I am a second year student in BTEC chemical engineering at this institute. I have gone through four or five my MOOC courses on data science, whatever it is, you know, AL, machine learning, data science, whatever that you want to talk there, I have gone through it. I have also gone through internship at four, three or four places. In the, he was there only for one year. So. And I am, I know I have done projects in the computer vision, natural language processing and so on. And I have two weeks time in this summer, that is December, uh, sorry, not summer, winter. This December two or three weeks time, I want to do internship under your expert guidance. What do I do? I mean, what is happening here? Why is it that he's a, he's a B-Tech chemical engineer? Please see what message we are propagating in this whole thing. That is the point I want to emphasize here. Now let us, the remaining 30, 40 minutes, 30, 40 minutes that I have is about the technical part of it. See? That is, first I thought, I thought I will talk about the evolution. Evolution of how did we end up in this AI and machine learning that we talk about today? Again, I please understand, please let me remind you, I am not expert here. But having said that, I can talk like an expert. <laughs> you see, because it's only for one hour, you know. <laughs> so the point here is oh, AI and machine learning, how we started. Of course, that itself we can go on for a few hours, but let us see. The AI itself, all of you know, has started as a science. Has started as a science in 1956. That is, science means, what is science? Understanding. You precisely read those statements where AI was, was introduced. What did it say? Assuming that we understand every process of how the human being does a particular thing, let us say, every process precisely, these words, I have the quote, but I didn't bring it. 
all of you know that Dartmouth conference this one provided you understand we can simulate a part of it and show that is the meaning of AI. AI was never meant to produce a machine which has a human intelligence and because AI itself is not fine. It is only to demonstrate your understanding of the science. That was science. And they minted the, the great scientists at that time at the Dartmouth conference and uh, including of course Shannon and uh, Minsky and so on. They are great mathematicians and scientists, you see. So they are not interested in building a machine and so on. They are interested in understanding how we do a few things, how I am able to speak like this and so on. That is what they are interested in. You see? And that was science started. And I skipped several steps here. Somewhere in the after 20 years, what happened was the story became engineering. What do you mean by the engineering? That means in 70s, all A became heuristic search. That means heuristic search is engineering. I suppose all of you know what is heuristic search and so on. And so the problem is, the pose the problem as a heuristic search problem, then you are addressing an AI problem. Of course, that is well applicable for a puzzles and games and so on. That is how chess, chess and other things were attempted at that time. And that heuristic set, those I was thinking I was in US at that time as a pro, uh, visiting faculty. So I was in the midst of all these people. They are saying something which I don't understand, but still, you know, you carry the vocabulary with them. And so the heuristic set idea was carried out to speech and vision, the natural tasks which human beings are endowed with. You see, that is why if you see this, uh, <clears throat> the the uh, uh, system that were developed, they are called IUS, SUS, speech understanding system and image understanding systems in 70s. And of course, that was a big thing in those days. Notice, please understand, the intelligent part of it, if there is any, was not in heuristic search, was in coming up with heuristic, even before that was in mapping the real world problem as a such problem is the intelligent part of it. If you have already mapped a speech problem or a vision problem as a uh, such problem, 90% are, are why 99% of intelligent part is over. So please understand this is a very fundamental idea. That means what it means is the intelligent part is not later. But it is in the, before that a human being is doing, without knowing that he is doing it. And then of course all the other things have happened. So that is engineering part of it. But even in that engineering, that means you use a lot of accumulated knowledge, you, you can't even articulate well how to invoke that in a problem like such a problem or heuristic such a problem, so that you can demonstrate some feeling of so-called intelligent activity of a human being. That is the uh, goal in those days. Nobody said that they will build a machine which will simulate human brain or intelligence and so on. But uh, notice, if you, any of you ever heard the name called Herbert Simon, he wrote a book on, it is available online, you can, although he is no more, it's uh, The Sciences of Artificial. The Sciences of Artificial. Very beautiful. You see, intelligence, AI started as a science, and then it is engineering, but engineering is not a dull activity. How do you, from the reality of your, the way you do, how do you make a system out of it, is a great engineering. And you can't even articulate that engineering, you design and demonstrate it. You see? And that is what has happened, that is Sciences of Artificial. It's about 250 pages book, very beautiful to read, although it is 50, 60 years old, 50 years old. That's second phase, that is science, engineering. I'll skip several steps here. And uh, last 10, 15 years. Notice that for about 20 years, somewhere after 85, 86 to 96, if you had spoken word AI, you were thrown out. You would not get a job. And all of you are AI people, please read AI's journal special issue. There are many, and one of them in 1998 or something by uh, you know, excellent 200 pages of various people arguing about AI and so on because by then nobody wants to talk. 
1948. Why? Machine learning. Machine learning was, you know, riding high in that period without knowing what machine learning or whatever you are doing, you call it as a machine learning. And then what happened was, I will skip that step, the last part of it, although I am broadly categorizing it into only three components, science, engineering, and now the technology. Now AI means whatever you do with the DNN and DL, I'm going to talk a little more about it. It's called AI. It is not that you have an idea of AI. Whatever you do with that, you call AI. And that's what we propagate. I don't think academic people say that ex explicitly that I know with whom. I, but just to leave this part, the outside, that is what they want to hear. So you also sing their song. It's exactly what happened. So the current is a technology where you have a few tools and whatever you do with the tools, yeah. And almost uh, before coming to this in the last 15, 20 years, they, uh, they, I must have read about close to 50 to 100 articles just to prepare for this talk, what people are talking about and so on. And fortunately, everybody says, yeah, the world, okay, they have, so that is what the current AI, you see. So now this is the evolution, how we end up, ended up. So now whether you like it, whether I like it or not, not that I dislike, please note that. I am only worried about the use of the terminology and propagation of that, you see. So now we are talking about uh, AI and machine learning. And the first thing is YouTube, that's terrible. Almost 50% of those YouTube lectures are all wrong. You see? And you keep saying that those are the inputs for us, unfortunately. You see? And different perspectives of this AL, I will just take these few words, AL, ML, DL. You see? For a public perspective, all of them are same. All of them are same. So in one set, you can put AL, DL, ML, and BL. And from a slightly industry perspective, you can see any YouTube. And uh, industry perspective, A, yeah, big circle, within that ML, within that DL. You see? The, the, he is explaining already what is AL. No, at least uh, I only wish I have not heard that. I, have, I only wish that I didn't know this subject. That is all that is going on. EL is a subset of ML, ML is a subset of A. That is how you are pumped in, in the public. Academic perspective, you take IITs or research people, anybody for that matter, you are yielding to that perspective, not that you agree with that. As you are doing research, every time you keep on questioning, setting your mind, what is going on here kind of a thing. So for you, maybe to satisfy them, you have three sets interacting a little bit, one, Another set interacting, another set. So there is slight commonality between AI and machine learning, DL and machine learning. That is what you think, because you know that this, what they're projecting is not right. And for researchers, philosophers like me, and not that I am a great researcher, but uh, philosopher, anybody can, you know. So researchers, what is it? There's nothing in common between these two. Nothing in common, because I don't even know what they mean. That is the problem, you see? I'm going to come to the terminology a uh, uh, little while ago, uh, later, you see? So this is the different perspectives of this. In all of these various three, four perspectives I have, what is forgotten by including philosopher is the real I and L. The I and L of human being, we lost long back. We don't even talk about it anymore. Okay. So that is the what is happening in these different perspectives of Yale. Now let me come to a little more brass tacks of this. Some of the things I picked up is from internet. That's the only source we have. What can I do? Okay. And uh, so I thought, what do I say for an audience? What is Yale? All of us should have some understanding so that with that understanding, I am, it may be right or wrong is immaterial. So with that understanding only, we are proceeding with the rest of the topics, you see. So AI means simulation of intelligence. AI means 
simulation of intelligence. ML means extract of knowledge out of data. This is the definition from internet. And all of us, if I am teacher and if I have to teach a course, probably that's what I have to do. Otherwise, students get confused. Unfortunately, it's totally wrong. This meaning, this is meaningless. You can never simulate intelligence. When do you simulate something? Only when you know, right? Go to the 56th definition of A. Only when you know the activity precisely every step of it, then only you can simulate. If I have, I don't think I will have time, otherwise I would have told a few stories later. But uh, right now, let us stick to this. So the A is a simulation of A, and then you create an aura around it. There is a weak AI, general AI, strong AI, God only knows what, the super AI, sorry. AI. What is all this going? Actually, you don't even know what is AI. AI. And you are already simulating it and you are saying, your machines become much more super, uh, what is that? Uh, out, uh, outclass or outshine or uh, you know, overtake human beings. What is all this going? Yes. You see? Explain a bit. No, that I'll come to. I have so many things to come. <laughs> you see? So the point I'm trying, please understand, I'm not criticizing anything here. All I'm trying to say is understand this in the proper context. That is all I'm saying. Please don't mistake me in any of this. Because I also do some of these things currently. So that is, uh, so, and then machine learning. Extracting knowledge out of data. There is IEEE transactions and data and knowledge engineering and so on. Only knows you see. Because the data that you collect, knowledge is already lost. There's no knowledge in it for you to extract. You don't know. And we want to extract knowledge out of it. And then we create it. What did we create in machine learning? I listed before again coming to this in the last one week. What are all the topics we discuss in ML? You see? And I think I came up with about 30, 40 topics and so on. Maybe one or two I might have missed and so on. And the most prominent and last of them are derivatives of the, is what we call supervised learning, semi-supervised learning, self-supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. In a day when you get up, the morning till evening before you go to bed, think how many supervised, semi supervised learnings you encountered during the day? Nil. Because not that it is wrong. All I am trying to say is that is an artificial domain you have created for you to work on. Not because that is the reality. I keep on asking myself, what is supervised learning today? Or what is that semi-supervised learning I am doing today? And so on. So we can see how the topics have evolved. That is probably for reason is because it's called machine learning. Actually, they are not machine learning topics. They are pattern recognition topics. They are pattern, I am coming to pattern recognition also very soon. They are pattern recognition topics. I see. And uh, so, uh, what happened in this, what do you study in pattern recognition? All these things. And uh, I don't want to quote or mention all of this. And you can see what is it that you do? It is pa pattern recognition means most of the time, most of the time it's a classification and regression. And classification and regression and using several methods and so on and uh, trying to find a discriminative underline this word. Discriminative learning is what you do. In all pattern occurs, nothing else. And then I keep asking myself since morning till evening, what discriminative learning I am doing today in daily life? Zero. You see? But discriminative learning. And in the process, what is missed here? Is uh, before that, anyway, I should also come to the other terms. DNN. <laughs> what is DNN? D. DNN, forgot. Deep, deep, uh, deep neural networks. It so happened, unfortunately, I have studied and 
Unfortunately, also I wrote a book which I should not have written. When I was ignorant of the subject, I could write a book. So, and it was almost 40 years ago, all this neural networking thing has started. But of course, one good thing about that is, initial part of this neural network area, 86 to onwards, has some physicists got into it. Physicists got into it, wrote excellent books, excellent books. Then engineers entered, they spoiled it. And of course, computer science students entered, if this, do this, if this, do this. That's what JNNs have become, I see. Otherwise, you know, all of this, JNNs are meant to understand this, uh, your limited understanding of the structure and functioning of the biological neural network, so that you can demonstrate a few of the so-called pattern processing tasks. As a human being, you do only pattern processing. Machine can never do pattern processing. Pattern processing tasks to demonstrate that. You can see that's right, hundreds of models of JNN addressing different pattern processing tasks and the learning uh, uh, algorithms associated with that and so on. This was what, you know, ANN was. But what is DNA? And what is learning? I suppose I, I'm sure you would have gone through courses on this and so on. What is learning? Learning from a biological perspective or even artificial neural network perspective is inspired by the biological network. Learning means it is trying to find a, underline the word, a solution to the set of inequalities that are posed by the problem. That is learning. If the inequalities are to be satisfied, or they, they can be met, then there are an infinite number of solutions. Arriving at any one of them is learning. Just please, there is no other meaning for learning. Learning has no gradient descent. So, but DNN, we talk neural network, there is not a single concept of neural network that is there in DNN. Please take it from me. Not a single concept. Oh, they, you may say, oh, this processor doesn't know. It has so many neurons interconnected and with uh, ReLU. What is that? Rectified linear unit, back propagation. Most of them have nothing to do with neural networks. Because the power. Some of you, if you had read the physics-oriented books and so on, you can see the power of a biological neural network comes because of that nonlinear step function that you have, which is the one which creates the inequality. It is the power, and the, the railway has nothing to do with neural networks. Even sigmoid has nothing to do with neural networks. Gradient descent has nothing to do with neural networks. First of all, Biological neural network is not a feed-forward neural network. You can't say I have one, uh, what is that, 100 layers, 1,000 layers, and the more layers you have, my AI system has performed, uh, you know, 99.9% .9 accuracy, all this is fine, but it has, not that that is unimportant, but attributing it to the neural network, Neural network is the one that causes confusion, and everybody, even today morning I was reading a pair, article in uh, <clears throat> IEEE Spectrum October issue, neural network. It is because of the DNNs, we are able to separate uh, uh, what is that musical mixer of music and that, that you can do is correct. But calling that as neural network confuses us. It confuses at least the students who are entering the field. That is the point there. DNN has nothing to do with it. I, am, I struggled in the last one or two years to figure out one single aspect of biological neural network that is there in DNN. No, I could not find. Because you should read a little bit of history of this and so on. Even convolutional neural networks and so on, uh, by Lee Kun and so on, they are all proposed for 30, 40 years. Even before that in 60s when Rosenblatt proposed this, we forgot that he made a very careful statement which all of us have ignored, the so-called association units. The association unit, that means when I am looking at you, or when you are listening to me, I capture the things that are required for me to understand, ignore the rest. That is the purpose of us. And that association unit of the biological network changes at every instant of time. 
the neural network architecture which we are using here it is changing at every instant of time the configuration itself changing it is reconfigurable uh, an, uh, architecture dna is possible as i told you so there is no neural network there is no learning and the deep learning because people are very careful they said deep learning doesn't mean that it learns deep it is only the deep neural network has uh, deep learning anyway that is about terminology and i will come to a little more mundane situations uh, uh, pattern recognition all of us study this i have at least about 20 books in my shelf pattern recognition i asked one of the top pattern recognition scientists in the world when i was in us i didn't want to name him but sir what is pattern recognition he opened up all this in in all the books there is nowhere meaning of pattern recognition is given that you see so the pattern recognition that is discussed in most of the cases is statistical pattern recognition where the problems are classification and regression in different forms Notice the starting point is feature extraction, feature space. Once you extract the feature space and feature and the feature space you create, you forgot how that has come. But the rest of it is all static. It has nothing to do with uh, pattern. You are only talking about the characteristic of the distribution of the feature vectors in the feature space and the discriminability of this from one class to another. But in my daily life, I don't have a classification problem in the first place. I don't have a discriminative learning in the first place. So what is missing here? And that is pattern recognition. That's why when I don't know all of you know Sriya Rao, Sriya Rao inequality. So he invited me uh, once to give a talk in the statistics department at Penn State in USA about 15 years ago. I don't know what to talk to statistics. I have zero knowledge of the subject. Then I said, the title I have given is, is pattern recognition a statistical problem? Pattern recognition a statistical problem. And I gave the talk and of course there was all, who is you in statistics is in the audience. And I am the only fellow who didn't know statistics. And at the end, Professor CR of, of the interaction at the conclusion, he said, if we listen to Professor Ignan, nobody will give us funds. Is true. Pattern recognition of when they apply it to human being. You see, it is not a statistical problem. And it's very unfortunate that person authentication, signature verification, face recognition, all of them are converted into deep data driven approaches. This is wrong. Simply wrong. You can still do what you are doing, but don't call it as a. You, when you recognize by face, you don't collect thousands of faces and then find out what is discrimination and so on. Each, the fundamental point here that we need to understand here is, especially the each individual has some unique characteristic with respect to the other person. And that's what you use for discriminating one or describing or sometimes identifying somebody. Discrimination, you rarely, as a human being, we rarely do discrimination. Please note that. We only do description. But there was also a descriptive part in the statistics, what is called the syntactic pattern recognition by KS4 in 70s. But it lasted hardly about five, 10 years. The whole thing is gone because you can't describe. Only human being can assimilate the discrimination, but he cannot express it. You see? So, now I have introduced that word discriminative learning is what uh, versus descriptive learning. And human beings do only descriptive learning, machines do only discriminative learning. Please note that it's very interesting. And uh, just uh, in passing about uh, half a minute, I will take to tell courses that we teach. We can't help it. Please note that I am not criticizing, I also teach like this one. We talk about digital signal processing. I suppose all of you have heard about it. Digital signal processing. The instructor never says that there is no signal in digital signal processing. The whole thousand pages has no signal in the digital signal processing. It's only digital processing. 
signal comes much later when you talk about biomedical signal processing or maybe even power spectrum estimation also is not signal processing. But we are saying experts in digital signal processing, which I am supposed to be, you see. So why I am saying all of not because it is wrong. Our ability, that is why a teacher, teacher is needed to remove these cobwebs when he's presenting something to the student. That's the point I want to make here. You see, so now we have discussed enough of uh, terminology. Now let me come to the, uh, the four or five issues. I have already introduced slightly the idea of, for want of a better name, this is not really the perfect way of saying, but uh, discriminative learning is all that you do is the DNN, DL, and the AI you are associated with that. Discriminative learning, that is why you need a huge amount of data. From that discriminative learning, you can never describe the individual. All of you imagine, I still have 10 minutes, am I work? Or so, uh, please imagine the following, you see. I write A, 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 handwritten, very crudely, not very carefully written. A, 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 put all of them together. I say this is one class. B, 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 B into another class. And C, C, C into another class. Maybe E, E, like this I will put. And I put ten, uh, some hundred examples of A, hundred examples of B, uh, like this. And now, it's a machine learning problem. What do you do? How do you discriminate this from this? Have you ever asked the question that the discrimination between A and B never uses the characteristics of A? You are never uses the characteristics of B. So by learning that discrimination, you can never describe A. On the other hand, for example, if you I, I am coming here, most of you are seeing me for the first time. So you get something, some description of me in terms of features. And I don't have to show my face 100 times. Next time, you know, even after 10, 20 years, you will say, oh, this is the guy that bored us for one hour. It's interesting what catches you. You see, that is what, and in fact, if you want me to tell, that is I. That is the I part of it, intelligence part of it. So I have a description and discriminative learning, and I will tell two or three interesting things here, which is what uh, if you if you don't want to hear and so on, or if you don't want to uh, hear something other than what you are doing, there's nothing I can do about it. But otherwise, you can see even the feature selection uh, from the data, whatever it is, there is what is missing is what is called the selective attention. Selective attention is a phenomena of intelligence. Is a, is a uh, characteristic of intelligence, selective attention. And that is the one that you use to describe or extract the feature from individual, and that is different for different people and different uh, objects, different class, uh, uh, this one and so on. And what is meant by selective? I can give hundreds of examples, but it will take at least two hours to do that. But uh, you know, in half a minute, what is selective? When you are listening to me, you see, you are not listening to all the sounds that I utter. You select. You select. How do you select? Whenever I lift my finger from now onwards, you know. What is it? God only knows. Okay. So, so whenever we don't know. And you are picking the, some sounds, he is picking some sounds, you are, you are making up the message. Because that depends on the knowledge. That is called selective attention. And that is human being, intelligent people are endowed with that. And you cannot articulate, you cannot explain, so you cannot write a program for that. So that is a component which we are not using beyond AI and ML. That's what I'm coming to know, you see? So selective attention. There are hundreds of things I'm highlighting. And the second thing is, a few examples, natural. Natural language processing. How do you do jobs? You know, even uh, H stand almost to start NLP because there is one crore job waiting, you know, that's the natural language processing. Have you ever asked whether there is any naturalness in the natural language processing? The answer is no. All the naturalness is destroyed 
before you start processing the natural language process. You may say, why am I saying this? I'll give you an example. First of all, language term, the use of a language. What do you mean by language? Language is something which we understand, a common understanding of a few symbols. It has nothing to do with text. Two symbols for us to communicate. That's why right from the childhood, from 60 uh, month onward, child start picking up some language to communicate with the parent, mother and also to communicate language. That is language. And fortunately, of course, now we may change our syllabus. Fortunately, for till about five years also, they don't have to worry about your grammar, subject, object, predicate, and so on. They do beautiful. Because I'm very imaginative, if you really listen to some of these two-year-old, three-year-old ch children, if they are not exposed to mobile phone, the kind of sentence that they construct is amazing. That is natural. That is natural. And notice that there is no text there. It is only spoken form. It is only spoken form and uh, there is no language. It is only the, so they don't, India has 23 lang official languages, some 500 the dialects, all this stop, stop this nonsense. India has, doesn't have any language at all. It has thousands of languages. I say, please don't uh, use that word language. Just because you have a script, I can write Telugu in uh, Devanagari or English, or English in uh, Devanagari. So it's not a language. Language has no script. Language has no, so why I'm saying all of this? It is a, have you ever seen child being taught, oh, don't give this much duration for this oval hour, give few milliseconds less. Have you ever taught children like that? They acquire this, they acquire this naturalness and so on. And then what is it that you do? For your machine learning, what is it that you do? Collect tens of thousands of hours of data and engage some hundred or thousand people. Now it is a cottage industry in Africa and China. You see, and uh, what is it that you, they have to transcribe this into text. By transcribing it, did you ever ask a question? You have already destroyed all the naturalness that is there in the text. And on top of it, if you start typing in uh, Microsoft Word, it will add its own masala to that. And even if you want to type something, uh, different from uh, this one. It will correct many times I type, and when I look back the previous sentence, I, I thought I never typed it. Microsoft already corrected my sentence. That is the hundreds and thousands of pages of text that you are processing in NLP. And that is what you are using in machine translation as a you know, Countries with primary objective or something to build empty machine translation, spoken language. Take it from me. They are all good exercises. I am not denying that. But they just don't solve the problem. And of course, our objective is not to solve a problem. Because if we solve a problem, we will be jobless. Very good. So this is the problem. And that's what Microsoft, or especially Apple and Google, they make sure that the problem or the solution they provide doesn't last more than six months. Look at the next version. You see, they buy back your old model and then give the new version and so on. So this is natural. Please apply your mind carefully. I'm not saying you should not do that. All I'm trying to say is understand what you are doing. That's the point I want. Everybody wants to do natural language processing, but see what you are doing in the natural process. All naturalness you are destroyed and built models. Now, to create naturalness, you artificially introduce this and so on. This is the Okay, I think I will. Uh, so, unfortunately, it's not possible to introduce the naturalness later. Because I don't even know what it means. When I am talking to you, I didn't come prepared like this. I should talk to you like this. It comes naturally, and you can't model it. The modeling part is the biggest thing. Of course, for engineers, it is required because you have to write a paper, publish it, you know, increase your index, citation index. You have to have great index of what is it? They don't have what is called the ignorance index. 
they have something else you see i wish they have that ignorance index also the more the problem that's why i always hide myself when he says 440 papers my god 440 noise i have papers of noise i have produced see? there's nothing there but that i do like a morning exercise walk so i also write a paper you see so the, please understand it so now coming to the concluding part of my this one i there are many more such things all i'm trying to say here is what to hear me and whether you like it or not this is the one that will dominate after 10 15 years when this saturates when what do you mean by saturating when you are done with it it cannot last the data driven approach cannot last for too long by the what do you mean by it doesn't vanish it becomes like a like just as the electricity bulb did you ever ask how a bulb works you just switch on like that those also become standard gadget rather than the, for you to do anything more what you have to do or some of these i have only listed two if i had time i would have put at least at least 20 more on this you see so and there are many many more that is the i part of it so the i part and the learning Human learning has nothing to, machine learning, first of all, is not learning. See, but take it for that, that learning, learning, continuous tense. Machine doesn't do continuous learning. Humans, you can say learning. Machines only learn. But machine learning, I don't know what it means, you see. So, and, but having said all of this, don't take it as a critical, this one. Look at it in a proper perspective, saying that, you see, these two are complementary things. What is in future as far as I can see? I could be wrong because I am already close to 80 years, 78, 79 years. So I, I may be wrong, but you know, you all of you are so great, you can project what is going to happen in future. But what I see as a problem is some of these things which are the complementary to the current understanding of AI. That is the point I want to make. So finally, in conclusion, I think before that, uh, I'll take two more minutes. Um, please, uh, I, I should not encourage. I'll just take two minutes. There's one in 2005. 2005, December. All of you know what happened? Because all of you, most of you are now young and not born. What happened? Tsunami. December tsunami. Even today, when I sleep at night, I feel so guilty. Why? Because if only I had applied my mind, my daughters, who are only some 15, 16 years old, they were upstairs and I was in IIT campus, they came running down. It was around 6 o'clock. And said, we thought something is shaking, they said. I said, don't disturb me. I'm reading newspaper, watching TV news, so don't disturb me. So that's what I, what happened? Just three hours later, three to four hours later, 50,000 people died in Kadalur, Tamil Nadu. 50,000 people died. Reason? That simple signal that they gave, I'm sure not only me, many of them, but at least they are, you know, I guided them and I said, send them away. At least if I, not that I have to do anything. I have all the mobile phone, everything, alert a few people and see, apparently, almost everybody saw reptiles, and, uh, uh, animals, cows, they are all moving away from the sea towards the shore. From that way, they can sense much farther. None of us noted we are all busy writing our papers for the next conference. You see, 50,000, not that even, just that one, even if you send 1,000 messages, even if two, three scientists do, and at least you could have alerted and some people would have been saved. No, 50,000 people died in, ever since that time. In fact, there was an Indian Science Academy general meeting just the next day. And they thought, oh, tsunami has happened, let us express condolence meeting and so on. In fact, I was sitting in the audience, being a fellow of the academy, and the one thing I thought, I wanted to go to the stage and say that all of us should resign from the fellowship of the academy. Because that is, the, that is where your intelligence comes. 
They have not used it. Well. There are hundreds of such situations. I'm just and what happened soon after that? You know what is DST? What is DST? Department of Science and Technology. They immediately sanctioned 120 crores for tsunami detectors to be installed all over. You will not get another tsunami for a thousand years in your lifetime at that point. What type of a thing is that? That's why, of course, people like, they won't leave them, you know. Somebody from uh, Australia came and said, uh, oh, we want you to give a keynote at this for a conference they are holding two weeks later. I said, I will not. But he insisted that I should talk. Then the title of the talk I gave was, The Signals We Don't Process. So please note that where the intelligence comes. Now we are masked, this intelligence of a human being. We are all endowed with such a beautiful part, which acts as a complementary to this. We don't even use that. The biggest, uh, anyway, I, uh, let me not. No, I have so many uh, examples to give, but I, just, I think it's not. So, uh, in conclusion, what I would like to say is, let us not fit problems to suit AI in machine learning. Let us find problem AI and L solution for the real problems that we have. You need both. You need both. Please note that no, otherwise, you know, we will be losing a lot. So many fantastic things are happening. But all I am trying to say is, you don't try to fit in. Don't make it a data-driven problem. Don't make it as a supervised and semi-supervised learning problem of a real-world problem. Because by then, you would have destroyed the problem itself. You see? And uh, <clears throat> finally, let us make, not make, rather, let us not make human beings, AI and machine learning experts, and machines intelligent and learning experts is wrong. You see? We should make human beings intelligent and learning experts. Machines, let them do AI and uh, ML and so on. I think it's very, very uh, important. And uh, uh, you can see some of the very inspiring, these days a lot of articles are come both ways. Of course, you should see the positive side of it, no question about it. But you should also be alert on what is going on. September. 2022 Signal Processing Magazine. Nobody should miss because all of you are doing AI course or AI department and so on. September 2022 Signal Processing Magazine. You can find simpler solutions for quite a few of the AI solutions that you are talking. That is the summary of that. And just about two, three days, uh, maybe four, five days ago, there's an article uh, in uh, Statesman's newspaper, The Intellectual Retreat. The Intellectual Retreat. Please read that. It's very interesting. It's only one page. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, in here? Okay. I thought I did that. Huh. So, uh, thank you, sir, uh, for uh, giving a very good insight into, uh, you know, AI machine learning pattern recognition. So, um, fortunately or unfortunately, so I am also one of the noise uh, professor Ignar I know produced <laughs> on the lighter side, sir. And uh, so many of the noises are in uh, our IIT faculty in uh, various IITs in India and abroad other uh, top institutions. And uh, not only your uh, noises, even the, I have produced 11 noises. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, they are also in IATs and a uh, few more noises are going to come in December. So I'm sure all of you would have, uh, you know, uh, enjoyed the talk. And uh, I think more than uh, technical people, a layman like, you know, our photographer, uh, uh, Lizin, Mr. Lizin, would have definitely understood what is AI. He can talk about AI, machine learning, and other things to anybody. Like, this is not correct, this is correct, this is not correct. I think we should, it's time we should tell that, you know, the, what it is and what it is not, okay? 
So the, all that message out of this uh, whole you know talk is that you no, know, uh, don't you know make too much hype about it. We should know like what it is, what is it is not. So thank you very much, sir, for you know giving. And uh, I am fortunate to be your student. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So now I request uh, you know Professor Linga Reddy, uh, University, uh, University of Agder, to give a small memento to Professor Linga. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, so let's move on. Uh, uh, the next talk is the settling machine uh, today and tomorrow by Oleg Christopher Granmo from University of Agder. Uh, is the founding director of the Center for Artificial Intelligence Research uh, from University of Agder in Norway. He did his master's in 1999 uh, and PhD degree in 2004 from University of Oslo in Norway. He has authored over 150 referred papers and seven best paper awards within machine learning encompassing learning automata, bandit algorithms, settling machines, Bayesian reasoning, reinforcement learning, and computational linguistics. He has further coordinated seven plus research projects and graduated 55 plus master and eight PhD students. He is a co-founder of the Norwegian Artificial Intelligence Research Consortium, Nora, and he is also co-founder of the company called Angis Technologies. So welcome, Ule. Uh, you can start sharing your screen. Welcome. Thank you for the introduction. I had to, to reconnect because uh, of sharing problems. So now I'm back. Thank you. Yes. Linga. We have we have uh, roughly one hour. Uh, if possible, you can shorten uh, to 15 minutes also. So that would also work. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So, can you see my screen? The PowerPoint slide? Yes, sir. Okay, I, I just try to, to switch as well. Did you see the switch? Yes. Great. Okay, so uh, thank you again. Um, today I'm going to present. Uh, New kind of machine learning technique, uh, the settled machine. Uh, it's uh, my take on uh, what my colleague now just uh, described as uh, descriptive uh, machine learning. It's it's the, fun the foundation is to try to describe um, the objects you are uh, learning about, and also it's symbolic. Uh, so I will come back to that. Um, so I'm from University of Agder, where I had uh, one of Norway's largest AI research centers, uh, Center for AI Research. Uh, we are more than 40 researchers that do uh, uh, basic research on machine learning and also applied research, um, developing new techniques and also solving um, import, uh, problems in health and uh, other areas of society. 
So we, uh, as we all know, there's uh, huge progress in in uh, machine learning these days, and uh, surprising and excite exciting results, maybe every month. So it's uh, it's an exciting time, uh, but there are also um, problems that I will come into uh, just now. Um, for those of you who haven't worked with machine learning, uh, the basic idea is to have uh, some input, uh, some observations. In this example here, it's a, it's a handwritten uh, digit zero. And, and then ha have an algorithm that is able to recognize and understand what it is it's seeing. Uh, and, uh, and then the output of this algorithm is, is uh, a label. So that this is a zero, of, and 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 most problems are kind of of this variant, uh, but there are, of course many different uh, variations of this. Um, so I will come into several uh, examples as I proceed. So uh, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, there is huge progress. Uh, but what is new uh, and has been new for some time is that currently it's the big tech companies that are actually driving uh, some of the develop or maybe some of the most important development, uh, and and that's because one of the reasons is that it has become so expensive to 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 do uh, machine learning research it requ requires so much computing power, so much data. Uh, and uh, that is a bit problematic because it means that very strong commercial forces are driving and uh, controlling uh, the AI development, um, and uh, and and uh, and that means that um, it becomes a resource for for the few uh, quickly, and it become we lose control of this very important uh, technology. Uh, and it, it become it's become increased increasingly aware that that there are several uh, challenges that must be solved before these te te AI techniques can be safely taken into use in in uh, society. And in particular, it's of course the progress of deep learning that has uh, been amazing. Uh, but at the same time, the complexity of these uh, models have become immense. We are now talking about trillion mod uh, parameter models for natural language processing, for instance, and it's very difficult to to uh, to uh, understand what's going on inside these networks. They are so complex, so they become what we call black boxes, um, and that is uh, that is uh, uh, worrying because we know that they contain hidden weaknesses and that they are uh, kind of not, it's not, they are not able to really model the world they make shortcuts and they may and uh, based on correlation and and uh, and that makes them um, uh, uh, brittle uh, and the most fundamental lack is this they they don't really understand the difference between correlation and causation, so they, 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 these models really don't understand how the world works. They learn simple correlations that make them good at uh, discrimination, like um, my colleague mentioned. But but they they lack like us humans they they lack the ability to to understand the world and how it operates and that that's also one reason why they require so much data, uh, and also why they make so so stupid mistakes at times. And 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 the, using such techniques for real world tasks is dangerous because they bring alone, uh, they learn from historic data, so they, for instance, they, they, they carry on discrimination uh, and all sorts of, of, uh, of um, uh, errors or weaknesses. Um, also, 
computation cost, like I mentioned, has become extreme. Uh, these uh, figures are uh, a few years old now, and it's much more, much worse today. Uh, it's so costly today, so so that uh, only the really, really, really um, uh, strong economic uh, powers can can really do this uh, research on on the state of the art models, uh, build, developing them and building them further. And uh, it's also a very problematic uh, um, envi environmental uh, footprint. Um, the, these again, these figures are a few years uh, old, and at, even at that time, just training uh, the the um, BERT model had the same um, environmental footprint as uh, lifetime uh, footprint of um, six U.S. cars, including fuel usage. So all this um, irritated me. It, I mean, uh, computers are really simple in, uh, uh, at the core. It's uh, and so I, I decided to 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 start from scratch uh, and uh, a few years ago, and and uh, to see is it possible to 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 do this differently. So I, I want to go back to the bits. Back to the simple stuff, uh, and that led me to go back in history of uh, of uh, artificial intelligence and to the work of a Russian mathematician, uh, Michael Setlin, who did some very interesting work in um, the early sixties on. A what I found to be a, a very beautiful learning mechanism. It's called the Settlin Automaton, and uh, and it's uh, the 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 paper is in in uh, Russian language, and it is was kind of forgotten, I think, because it's um, and it's, uh, so so his work. He died early at an early age. He died at the uh, age of forty three. And, and somehow this this uh, beautiful uh, theory and and uh, and the approach to my learning got lost, more or less, not fully, but more or less. Um, and it is so beautiful because to, to me because uh, it solves a very fundamental problem in in uh, machine learning, and that is uh, how. Uh, a well-known problem, and that is how to learn from penalties and rewards. Um, and it does it in a so simple and uh, elegant way, because the, the basic task is to the, the learn which action is best, action one or action two. And what you see here is an, um, uh, um, an experiment with a rat learning to make the best the, the, uh, the, the decision in the maze to get the most amount of cheese. So a rat, a biological intelligence, uh, the rat learns very quickly which path is gives them um, uh, most frequently rewards, even with noise and uh, or cheese, uh, even with noise and, and randomness. It learns where it is best to go. And the model of um, an algorithm of uh, Settlin model this, and it's based on um, just remembering a number, uh, an integer, and then just adding or uh, one or subtracting one, that is increment, decrement, uh, to learn. So, so I will got, get a bit back to that a bit later. But it's so efficient, it's so uh, simple, and it's uh, and it learns very well. <clears throat> so then I, I had this learning mechanism, and and then. My next question was, what can you, how can we do use this to learn about the world and how to learn about uh, uh, to do uh, pattern recognition and to to reason, and that, that uh, and I decided that I wanted to use propositional logic for this, because propositional logic is um, uh, from philosophy and is used by humans to model uh, and re uh, reasoning and uh, knowledge and uh, uh, and um, so it's very easy for us to understand uh, at the same time it's also the language of computers 
So it's uh, it's uh, very efficient uh, and it maps directly down to 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 the language of computers because uh, propositional logic is exactly the same thing as Boolean algebra. So you, you can uh, map it straight down to to the the, the gate or the logical gates uh, in hardware. So it's uh, not only is it easy for us to understand, but it's also uh, very nice for computers to 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 uh, do computation on. So then I had my two components that I wanted to do uh, to use to uh, to to build a, a machine learning approach. So that ended up with the settler machine, and it consists of thousands of these uh, rat brains, mathematical rat brains, plus uh, and, uh, propositional logic. And that means that these uh, settling automata, they are actually writing uh, logical um, uh, formulas. Um, these are uh, the core team today doing, um, uh, so this was in 2018 and it's uh, four years ago now. Uh, this is the, the core team today. Uh, so. The, so I will explain very uh, shortly what the key, uh, how the settling machine works. But but we are, now it's uh, the field has grown, and uh, today it's uh, several core areas, and this are, is the core team. It's uh, researchers in the uh, uh, University of Newcastle and in microsystems working on settling machine hardware. Uh, uh, very efficient and and uh, and uh, fast. And then we have a team here in uh, in Norway working on logic and natural language understanding with Settling Machine. And we have also a team working on the theoretical foundation, uh, uh, doing mathematical analysis of the learning mechanisms. And we have uh, people working on reinforcement learning, like uh, game playing games and. Uh, and also uh, algorithms, new kinds of algorithms and architectures where, where the settling machine is in, in, the, in the core. And of course, applications in several domains, in health and in uh, financial trading and uh, in, um, in uh, uh, law and so on. So, uh, and, and, um, and right now, it's uh, research groups across the world are uh, picking up on this, and uh, lots of exciting development going on uh, worldwide on in several different um, areas. Um, so, uh, so, so, uh, lots of ha things are happening uh, happening these days in, in the settling machine um, research. Um, so, uh, what my vision? is that uh, the settling machine is to be a democratic AI uh, as opposed to an, a commercial AI. Uh, and that means that uh, the settling machines uh, gives uh, AI to the people uh, and it's free. So I share everything openly and in the, in the GitHub, uh, open access and so on. Uh, and it's also green because it has very low uh, uh, computational requirements. And uh, and accessible, it's fully transparent and uh, um, and uh, easy to to inspect and quality assure and understand and build upon and develop further. Um, so, what what is the difference between deep learning and a settling machine? How, how will I, how will like what is the fundamental difference in operation? So uh, here you again we look at uh, this. Uh, Kind of simplified model of deep learning. You send um, something in the input, and then it uh, it goes through many many layers on nonlinear uh, transformations, and out you get the answer. But you, it's very difficult to, to understand what, why is this a uh, zero. Of course, there are techniques to to approximate an explanation, but it's not really an explanation uh, that are fully accurate. Settled machine, on the other hand creates simple uh, Boolean or logical patterns that are describing uh, directly uh, the pattern in the what in the input uh, and how to recognize it. So here you see different parts of a zero. So what you see in the middle here is uh, to the left uh, is uh, like the upper part of the zero. It, it ones are like the, the black pixels and zero is the white pixels. 
and you see the ones are the kind of capturing the curve to there to the uh, of the zero and then you have the stars which are optional that that means that the pattern captures a thick uh, line or a thin line it is optional it's they are either zero or one and then to the the, the pattern to the right is uh, the, the, another part of the zero so it's very efficient you just match the pattern towards the input and you know it's a recognition or not and then you then these are combined to, to the to make a decision um, here is another uh, well-known uh, deep learning architecture, also a very simplified version of um, of uh, Go, the board game of AI for the board game Go, and it's an extreme, hugely complex uh, deep learning network that that processes the input to, to propose uh, which move to make. It's uh, so com uh, complex that even with all the power of uh, Google. Um, Google, it uh, they are it's only able to evaluate uh, 1,800 positions before it has to make a move so um so it's very complex and also very um uh, difficult to interpret this is uh, a settled machine approach we are very early in this research of course but but it's completely different it's just taking the board and then just saying if if black has pieces here and here and here uh, uh, but no white, no white pieces. That is a red color across the cell. No white pieces here and here and here. Then this is a strong position, and this will uh, this can lead to a, a to to a win, or uh, this is a weak position and this can lead to a loss. So you get both the interpretation and the pattern right there. It's super fast to evaluate, and at, and it gives insight into the to the game. Uh, final example, uh, natural language processing. <clears throat> Settling machine use uh, like simple rules. Uh, then the pattern is just which words defines a concept. So it's it's very simple, and you can do uh, learn a natural language uh, task with just a few uh, thousand uh, patterns. And here is the example here is it's uh, just learning how to represent a causal information in the text and you see it's just uh, uh, different uh, ways you can describe something that is caused like caused and been caused by and so on and it's just checking if these words are present in the text and then uh, doing the matching and then you have the recognition so it's but amazingly uh, on more and more data sets it's uh, actually competitive with BERT for instance which is uh, hugely more complex uh, for this task. Um, so I, I will now explain what is a settler machine, and I will teach you the basics. And at the end, if uh, there's more time, I will also uh, tell a bit about uh, recent progress and also what is ahead of us in, in the future. So I will first look at the inference. How do the settled machine do inference, like uh, um, process the input and make a decision uh, for the output? Uh, and then after that, I will explain you the learning. The learning is the most difficult part. Uh, even if it's extremely simple, it's it's uh, still uh, with the, just a couple of uh, learning rules. It's it's um, the complexity of the learning is um, a bit difficult to grasp for the first time. But let's start with settled machine inference. So this is this is the basic architecture. It's uh, you have the input, which is uh, the zeros and ones or uh, boolean variables, true and false. Then you have the rules, which I, I call clauses. You have a set of these, and then you have a voting scheme that just to the, um, collect the output of the rules, and then you have a decision uh, to make. And the feedback is based on what is called this bandit learning, which is uh, penalties and rewards, uh, and it's based on the settling automaton. <clears throat> so let's start with a simple example, uh, and now we will see that the settling machine learns to recognize and not to disc but it also is able to discriminate based on this recognition uh, so it describes it describes the world and it learns to recognize and discriminate but it the key is to this to describe so here is the example data set i will use it's uh, different kinds of cars uh, and uh, with colors and, and and types and so on and uh, i will also use planes as a counter example 
So the first step of settled machine learning is to turn it into to logic or to, and that is uh, simply saying statements about uh, what things looks like. So here are the four, six different observations in this table, very simplified. The three first are cars, and the three next are uh, play, uh, some, not cars. Uh, Set machine learns also what does a car look like and what does a car not look like. Uh, and in this case, it will also be, I will use planes at something that is not a car. So a car has four wheels, it transports people, and it can have also different colors, blue or yellow. They are not characteristic, but uh, I mean defining, but they are part of the description of a car. Um, and then the, the planes, may, uh, the car doesn't have wings, so the, that means the small dot is not. It lacks wings, and the big dot is it has it. So uh, the, the four last examples, it's uh, planes, and they are, have, of course, have uh, wings. Uh, the next step is to create the patterns, the description of the of the word. And here it is very simple clauses, uh, that is if then rules. And this is uh, for classification. I will mainly focus on classification to the, today. But the, the, there are other uh, kinds of learning as well. And the, you simply describe the condition, which is uh, the object you're describing, the kind of object you're describing, and then you conclude with a class. So that's that's uh, that's what the, the clause. Uh, and you use and to describe things because and is uh, means that you can describe co complex things by combining different elements. So we can say that, for instance, or maybe a car is something with four wheels and to give, transports people, two things together. And that makes you able to actually describe uh, as complex or the fine details if you like. You just add more properties to the, add more detail to the description. But it's also, uh, and then you can then you can make a decision like, uh, okay, if it has four wheels and transports people, I think it's a car. So that's one rule. Uh, but very importantly, and that is crucial, is also to describe what something doesn't have. It's very important for humans. To, we, we, we also know what a car is not. And so not negation is extremely important. And, and that is also added to the, is also part of the uh, description. So for instance, uh, this is a much better rule for car. If it has four wheels, it transports people, and it doesn't have wings, then it's a car. So, so negation is a very crucial uh, part of the description. <coughs> uh, formally, we can use symbols like this. So like we use the variables, which are the inputs, x1, uh, and the AND operator, and the NOT operator. And then we can build what we call the positive de descriptions. That is, we describe, this is my uh, description of a car. And then we also have, and it's, we call them positive polarity. And then we also have something called negative polarity. It means that this is not a car. So this is, uh, which is so, we need to know that as well when we want, but we describe that what a car does not look like as well. So we describe everything. Uh, here are a few examples that I briefly touched upon. Uh, because we, the, we, of course, the, the, um, the, we, we can map this to, to uh, visualize it in different ways so that we can make it uh, easy to interpret. So the first example to the left is just a, a pattern for a, a handwritten uh, one, where you see that there has to be a core with, with, a, with a white pixels in the center and then optional thickness. Or if it's a board game, it's just say, there should not be pieces here and here and here, and then it's a strong position for the, at this current stage of the game for, for black. Or in, in natural language, if the text simply contains rash and reaction, this is from a medical health case, rash and reaction and penicillin, then, then the, the, this sentence is about allergy. Super simple to interpret and also very efficient to, uh, to compute. And surprisingly, extremely accurate. So, uh, so then we so then we need what the set machine do is that it combines several such rules. So here is the first rule is uh, the, uh, the description of what a car is, and then the second rule is a description of what a plane is. And of course, you can have multiple rules for car because you have different kinds of cars, and you can have multiple rules for plane 
because you have different kinds of planes. Um, and then, then you want to recognize something. So these rules can be used for a lot of things, but and, but I will focus now on classification. And then you just want to know what is this kind of object. So this this is uh, from my uh, I, uh, from my book, the book I'm writing. So this is uh, this is the first chapter from the first chapter of the book I'm writing on the settled machine. So first you get the input. It's a blue plane. It has four wheels. It transports people. It's blue and it has wings. And then each then you check which rules are matching. So the first rule to the left uh, it is requires four wheels. That's uh, okay. It has four wheels. Transports people. Yes. Check. Not wings. No, it doesn't match because this uh, object here has wings. So then only the second rule matches. If wings, then plane. So then plane gets one vote and car gets no votes. So the decision is plane. Super simple and efficient. Um, and, uh, and that is the, the key. So formally, it looks like this. Uh, you have a set of positive polarity clauses that you evaluate and then you add up how many are um, true to get the votes for the target the object you're going to recognize but then you also evaluate the negative polarity clauses that are what is supposed to not be and if and those are subtracted to the to the sum to the voting sum and then you have like your confidence in in the, so you have then you deal with uncertainty and noise because then you have a confidence in how well is this uh, fitting with your descriptions your input uh, and then you simply make a decision based on a threshold. If if the votes are equal to about zero, you conclude that you recognize the object as the target class, or if it's below, you say it's not that kind of uh, class. Um, so that's that's the inference. And uh, one more example, XOR problem. You know, XOR is very difficult because it's nonlinear, and many like naive bias cannot uh, deal with XOR. Uh, decision trees cannot deal with XOR. Uh, linear regression, logistic regression cannot deal with XOR. Uh, neural networks can deal with XOR. Uh, 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 yes. So uh, here you see input uh, one zero. Uh, and then it's either it's either output one or output zero. And what you see here is that to the left side you have the patterns for uh, or descriptions of uh, uh, output one and it is either is x1 or and not x2 it's one pattern the other pattern is not x1 and x2 and here it's actually x1 and not x1 is matching so then then output one gets one vote to the right side you see the patterns for output zero and it's x1 and x2 or it's either it's not x1 and not x2. So you see that it's the description. It's a description of the objects. It's not uh, and and here you see that the only um, uh, output one get a vote, so the output is one. So it correctly outputs and deals with x or. So how so that is uh, but how can you learn these expressions? That that is when the, that's uh, the big question, and that's where the settling automata comes in. Um, and and I will try to to explain how this works today. But the, and this is the full architecture uh, where you have the clauses, uh, and I will go through this in step by step. But you have the, the you're writing the rules, so you have two rules here: one to the left and one to the right. One positive polarity rule and one uh, negative polarity rule. And then for each possible. Um, feature or negation of a feature, you have a single settling automaton. And it operates completely alone, independently, and it's just to have one decision to make. Should this, uh, should uh, so the first one just decide, should X1 be part of the rule or not? And the first one has here decided to the left, has decided that X1 should be part of the rule. So this is building XOR. Then the two next ones are deciding, X should X2 be a part of the rule? No, it says, no, it should not be a part of the rule. Uh, should not X1 be part, uh, be a part of the rule? Uh, no, it should not, so it's not part of the rule. And then the fourth one says that X, not X2 should be part of the rule. So then you get X1 and not X2. And then the, that's the first clause of rule. And then the second one, the, the opposite, the negative polarity rule, so then it's different. Then the two first settling automata says that x1 and x2 should be part of the rule so that you get x1 and x2 and then next two says uh, they should not be part of the rule 
X, not X1 and not X2. Uh, and then there's something called type 1 feedback and type 2 feedback that, that uh, guides this settling automata. But, and it's completely parallel and decentralized. So every settling automata here is only receiving penalties and rewards, and it's just uh, updating its states. So it's very um, uh, easy to parallelize. So how can the settling automata learn at all? That is the first question, and that's what's uh, the amazing thing. Um, and I'll show you how it learns. Uh, you start, this is uh, your state space. So the settling machine has an automaton. This is an automaton of settling. It has just see a memory, and it's just an integer, and it's a, set, and a final state automaton. So this one has six states of memory. And it randomly starts in the middle, either on the left side or the right side of the middle. And on the left side, you always do action one. So it's deterministic. On the right side, you always do action two. Um, and when uh, you get a penalty or a reward, you switch position. So if you get a penalty, you move towards the middle, that's the dotted lines. And if you get a reward, you move away from the middle. When you move away from the middle, it means you are more certain that action one is best if you are on the left side. And if you move away from the middle on the right side, you become more certain that action two is best. And if you are in the middle, you are uncertain. You, and that means you quickly switch action. If you are in the middle, you are uncertain. But if you get confident, you, you stay with your action. So for example, if you get you do action one now because you are on the left side, and then maybe you get a penalty from the environment. Then you switch to to the follow the uh, the penalty uh, transition, and you are now on the right side, and you do action two instead. Maybe you get a reward now. Then you get more confident in action two, and then you move further away from the middle, getting more confident. So you have so this is your memory. So that's that is very, it's so simple, I, but but amazingly, it can learn the optimal action with the pr probability close to one with increasing memory, and training time. So how can we so how can we learn? We learn from by the trying to describe, remember what we're seeing. So set machine tries to remember what it sees and it it and recognize it or describe it. So it observes objects and then it tries to remember what it has it has seen. Uh, and like humans, it forgets. It forgets the fine details and it remembers the the, the important ones. So, so maybe maybe you have forgotten the color of your neighbor's car where you lived maybe ten years ago, but you remember maybe that he had a car. And it has and it had wheels. So this is a traditional memory. The the information is either in memory or out of memory. So you have seen a, you have a, you have remembered a car that it has four wheels, transports people, and a blue. This is a computer memory, right? And that is your uh, rule. Uh, so either in memory or not in memory, uh, but settling machine has graded memory. So it's uh, it has different. Uh, uh, you you remember things uh, with different strengths. So you it's either uh, so and this is uh, you decide how deep the memory is. But you have you you for, forgotten the information about the object, or you have more and more strongly memorized it or forgotten it. So uh, so it's either. It's from maximally forgotten to forgotten to memorized to maximally forgotten. And of course, all the degrees here you can add as you like. And that means that, that you can uh, like kind of simulate uh, uh, like uh, or model human memory, maybe. <clears throat> and the memory maps to the like the, an automaton uh, like this, so that you are uh, either you have forgotten your, uh, the information or the, the feature, or it's uh, memorized and it's different states. So that that's get your, give you the connection to the settling automaton. And I will use that to show the updates. How, how is this memory updated to learn to describe objects and also to see the difference between planes and cars. Uh, the rules are so simple. It's almost, it's a bit surprising that they work <laughs> uh, because what happens if that if you see your, the object, you're going to learn what looks like. Then you see, you see a car, and you know that's what I want to learn what a car looked like. That and then you check your rules for cars, and 
if the rules are true, the condition is true, you simply try to memorize everything you see about the object. Create a description of what you're seeing, and that is these transitions you see here. It means that you go, it, the information goes from the feature goes from the forgotten side towards the memorized side. So the more you see a car with four wheels, the more you remember that car has four wheels. Uh, and that every time you recognize it, you reinforce your memory about what a car looks like. Until you get to the maximally memorized side, then you st st stop uh, there. And this value is called memorization value. It's a parameter, but it's usually one. And then you forget everything you don't see. And that is uh, the rest. What is so you see a car that is has four wheel and it's blue, then you start to forget yellow cars. Yellow. You start to forget yellow because you're not seeing a yellow car. So then, and forgetting is slower. So uh, it's uh, but and it goes the opposite direction. So it goes from the memorized part to the forgotten part side, and but it's not the same speed. It's it you forget slower than you learn. That's important. And that is the forget value, and that's just a random value. You, so it's one over s, and and it's just a random. Uh, it's a number between zero and one, and it decides how quickly you forget. So if it's one, you for, if s is one, like the probability is one, you forget very quickly. If s is ten, the value is zero point one, and then you forget slowly, and you can remember things for a longer time. So this is the example uh, of, uh, of a memory. Initial, we can typically initialize it. This is for one making one rule, and you typically we initialize everything to be on the forgotten side, but almost slightly almost remembered, but uh, not yet. So then and then we put in all the different kinds of information you have about the world here. That something could have four wheels, something doesn't have to, cannot have four wheels, or whatever. Everything that you want to have in a description could be here. All possible, just add them in. Set in the machine easily deal with ten thousands of uh, information units, like this. Uh, then we observe a four car with uh, four wheels. It transports people. It doesn't have wing, and it's not yellow. It's blue. So then we we rec uh, and we don't have we haven't seen a car yet so we don't the rule is empty so we simply then we okay it has to be a car. That means that we reinforce or memorize everything we see. We see four wheels. We see transport people. We see blue. Uh, we see not wings. Here we have a small memorized value just for experimentation. So we see that some of the memorization is skipped. So it's only the arrows shows what this, the change in memory. So what we see is that blue is reinforced, memorized, not wings. Now uh, transport people and four wheels. The other ones that are false, that like not four wheels, not transport people. You don't see that. Th those are forgotten. So they move us move downwards. Then we observe something new. We observe uh, for a car with four wheels, transports people, not wings, and it's yellow and it's not blue. But we see here that we learned that the car is blue, so we don't recognize this. It's yellow. It cannot be. We don't recognize it as a car. That means that we forget everything because it's not a car. So we have to just erase our memory. We have misunderstood what a car is. And this is again. This is random. This forget thing. So it's slow. And then uh, maybe only transport people is actually like executed plus blue. But four wheels remains in memory. So now we think that the car is uh, four wheels. Car is four wheels. Now we see a new car. It has four wheels. It transports people. It doesn't have wings. It's yellow and it's not blue. Now we recognize it. It has four wheels. Now we reinforce again. And now this time four wheels is reinforced once more and transports people is reinforced, memorized. And but not wings is skipped. It, it it doesn't have wings. It could have been memorized, but it's skipped because of the random updating. This is your final rule now, after observing cars. You think that a car is something with four wheels and it transports people. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, but this is not, uh, you're not done yet because you want to see the difference between cars and plane. And then that's the third kind of, the second kind of feedback. That's the last kind of feedback. It's called type two feedback and it's, it, 
it, it, it uh, um, makes you recognize the difference between what is not, what, what objects, kinds of objects. And the update is like this. If you observe something that is not what you're look, learning to recognize, like if you, you're trying to learn what a car is, but you observe a plane, this is that's what you do then. If the if if the rule is tr true matches, it means you made a mistake. You you're stating that the plane is a car. What you do then is you try to memorize all literals that are on the for or inputs features that are on the forgotten side that are also false. It means that you try to say learn what it is this plane is not what you when you see it. So, for instance, if you observe a plane and it has four wheels, transports people, it has wings, it, it's not yellow and it's blue. Uh, then it's your, your rule match because it has four wheels and it transports people. What you do now is to do opposite of what you did with when you recognized the car. Because you, now you want to learn what it's, what it, uh, it's false. So you reinforce everything that is you're not seeing. So you're not seeing not four wheels, you're not seeing not transport people, you're not seeing not wings. And you're not seeing yellow because, and you're not seeing you're not seeing not blue. So all these are false because what you observe has had wings, for instance, so that not wings is false. So you do the opposite of what you do when you recognize, see what you are supposed to learn. So that is your end rule. It's four wheels. Uh, a car is something with four wheels. It transports people and it doesn't have wings. So now we can recognize car and describe it. Uh, roughly, and you know that uh, to see the difference between a car and a plane. So that's it. That's the learning. So it's, it's these very, very simple rules that you just uh, use on each um, automaton, and that's how you learn. <clears throat> Actually, this can be modeled as a Markov chain because each individual unit is. Um, Final state automaton. So this is uh, this is uh, and as you know, the Markov chain can you can do sophisticated mathematical analysis to to understand how it develops and understand the process, and that means that you can use a Markov chain to understand and analyze how a certain machine learns. So this is the uh, this is from the chapter two of the book that I will publish soon. And it shows that a certain uh, autom no, learning automaton, or literal, literal automaton with the four me the memory depth four, uh, can be seen as a Markov ch uh, chain. And you, the transition probabilities are the problem uh, uh, properties. So, like the probability of seeing something given you have a car, or the probability of seeing a car, or the probability of not seeing a car, and the probability of observing not wheels, for instance, when you don't see a car. Everything can be specified mathematically, and then you can actually calculate what is the learning outcome. So you don't even need to run an experiment. You can actually get formulas for uh, for the learning outcome. And and uh, of course, it doesn't scale so well when you get a large problem, but uh, you can learn a lot from small problems. So here is a very simple example problem. We're just going to learn OR. Uh, and so your target, your, what you're trying to learn is that uh, x1 or x2, so x1 and x2 are your observations. And you're only allowed to use two rules for this. So you're only allowed to use two rules. So then there's only one solution or two solutions. You, you have to have one rule that says if x1, then uh, you have output 1 or uh, y, uh, the target. Um, or if you have x2, you also have y. Then you also cover you, then you all cover x or. What you don't want is a rule that says if x1 and x2, then y. That is also true if for or. If both x1 and x2 are true, then you also have output one. I mean uh, true. But you but if if you take if you pick that one, you you cannot solve the problem because then you you don't have enough rules to describe uh, what you need. So that's kind of what you will say is a local optimum. It's a solution that is locally, it looks correct. It's always right. You always predict correctly and you observe X1 and X2 and you, you get it right. But it's local because you get, don't get the global solution. But if you do a Markov chain analysis, you will know what the setting mod machine does. This is a bit lot of information here, but what you essentially see is that uh, you have now two rules that you're building 
and then you have four memories, four automata, and one is uh, the first one is the, the the top the columns are the ones two ones that are building rule two, and the rows are the two ones that are building rule one, and then you have uh, the memory of each. And oh, and then you get, of course, you have four, each has the depth four, so you get four times four, uh, uh, times four, times four, <laughs> total uh, state space for the all different kinds of memory positions, so it gets quite, quite many possible states. And then you see the probability distribution here uh, over the different combination of states, of memory states. And what you see, and this is after the learning has converged and is calculated with the Markov chain uh, analysis. And what you used to see is that there are two possibilities. Either rule one is uh, x1 and rule two is x2, or they swap roles. And so they, 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 it converge, it is the outcome is actually the solution to the problem and the probability of producing rules that are contain x1 and x2 is zero. So it avoids the local optima, it finds both of the two global optima, uh, if you analyze it mathematically. And that's also what's happened uh, in practice when you run it. So that is that is uh, that is the um, ingredients of learning, uh, and it, as I said, it works very well. I will show you a few examples. Um, so I will spend a, uh, a few more uh, minutes on this. Uh, but now we, you know, you know, know everything you need to know about the the certain machine, how it works, and everything in, after this is more like variations of it. So first of all, the first so, 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 second breakthrough was that we actually found out that you can also do regression with this approach. You simply change the voting threshold uh, the, to uh, a range from uh, a minimum range from uh, y minus min to my max, and then you just um, map the voting number to to a particular value, and then you do exactly the kind of, kind of same feedback. It's, if it's too high, you do type two, and if it's too low, you do type one. Um, Linga, how much time do I have left? I think uh, we have uh, five minutes more. Okay, great. Then I uh, I cover the the remaining parts. Yes. Uh, so regression works, and surprisingly. We tried, for instance, to do uh, to learn about mapping uh, um, binary representation of numbers to to the decimal uh, representation, and it, we found that the certain machine decomposed and found uh, rules that recreated the binary to digital uh, to decimal uh, integer conversion. Also, it performed very competitively with regression uh, trees, with random forest, and support vector regression. Next, uh, next uh, breakthrough was convolution, using a rule as a convolution uh, filter, and then just passing the rule to the input uh, and looking for a match. So we can learn like this small, uh, like a three by three uh, pattern inside an image. And the solution was very simple. It was uh, was a very just randomly picking out those that matches at the location they match, and also and then uh, do a standard updating. Um, and then you get all these small patterns that uh, these are they, they describe different numbers that uh, that uh, that you can recognize in different parts of the image, and and you, you can learn how to to decompose an image into small pieces. Uh, Performance-wise, it's uh, on, a, on a, some of the simple data set like fashion MNIST, uh, K MNIST, MNIST, and so on. It's very competitive towards uh, deep learning, and uh, it's uh, outperform all, all the classic machine learning techniques. Yeah. Uh, yes, and also you can just you can scale complexity up and down because you simply decide how many rules clauses you want to use use for your problem so if you make use 250 you get a small scale simple solution and then you get a bit lower accuracy but uh, but you get much uh, much less memory and much faster computation and then you can just add more clauses to get more and everything is happening decentralized so every new clause is helping the other one to solve the problem in a better way so the more rules or clauses you add the better accuracy you get 
Uh, then, uh, very recently, we found out how to do relational logic, and that means that you can start to mo model uh, like word knowledge, like how the word operates, and do abstractions. So we simply map the input into to relations, and then you do abstractions, and set the machine learn general rules. For instance, what is a grandparent? Uh, with with the promising accuracy results. Uh, and then you can learn logic, uh, logic, do logic programming and logic learning with noisy data, uh, which is uh, which is very difficult. Uh, even more recently, we found out that uh, so if you have um, uh, if you have a short memory and forget quickly, you can you pick out uh, and learn uh, very robustly. So if the set machine quickly forgets, it learns uh, use a lot of uh, negation to learn what something doesn't look like. And then it becomes very robust, it turns out, towards what is called counterfactual data. That is a way to kind of uh, test if um, a system has just learned co correlation or if it's actually learned real knowledge. So it's very difficult to trick the settling machine after it has, has learned. Uh, and it learns like what, like, for instance, it says that uh, positive is like uh, uh, Truly, uh, and then uh, we, we, this is kind of a positive word, and then it's not depressing and long, not long and not worst and so on. So it describes what not positive is in natural language. And it, it like, uh, and this made it like really good at picking out the important words of the text and and uh, for classification and and I gave good accuracy results uh, compared to other techniques. Uh, BERT is uh, still a big challenge to to, to beat. We beat it in some data sets, but in other one, because of the pre-training vertos on huge amounts of data, it's difficult to beat in some data sets, but we are working now on self-supervised pre-training with the settling machine. That, that is promising. Then we have a two-layer solution that puts all the rules in a one big pool, and then it self-organizes to learn rules to, to learn different objects uh, and share properties among objects, so we can have sharing of properties. Uh, and then, the, and that is maybe the, currently the like the, the state of the art in in in, in the settling machine uh, uh, pattern recognition. And and it gives even better results on uh, on uh, on images, for instance. So now you can actually get 98.33 percent accuracy on learning MNIST with 50,000 uh, handwritten digits, just with 50 rules per uh, digit. And uh, and uh, and and uh, moves uh, the pushes the the performance of settling machine. We also have completely parallel solutions where one core can run one rule uh, and build one rule, and and it can run with uh, with almost uh, um, uh, linear scalability on on thousands of cores on GPU. Um, so it becomes very fast. Theoretical analysis, we're starting to have proofs of convergence on several different uh, um, properties. Um, and we also have very uh, new chips for the settling machine, designed for settling machine, which are getting more and more energy efficient and faster and far, faster and, and, uh, and are developed in uh, microsystem and University of Newcastle. Future, uh, on my part, is very quickly, uh, multimodal learning across different kinds of data and also self-supervised. We do all these kinds of data separately. Now we want to combine them like you do in deep learning and learn across the data, different kinds of data. But here you get logic and logical descriptions. Second, create a set in automation machine that is causal. Let's see the difference between cause and effect. It's much more easy to make a settling machine do that because it's logic, so you can do manipulation of the logical expressions and add some extra functionality to, to make it causal. Uh, and third, to use the rules to, to do get probabilistic uh, understanding, so you can also do probabilistic reasoning. Uh, because settling machine is probabilistic in the bottom, but you just need to, to understand how can we do probabilistic uh, exact probabilistic reasoning like you do in a Bayesian network on top of it. So this is just a new, uh, a new research project that we got funded from the Norwegian Research Council that is starting up uh, as we speak. I try to put as much as possible of resources online. Uh, so we will find uh, uh, on GitHub, uh, you will find um, uh, different resources if you want to start to, to look into this uh, field. Yes.
that uh, concludes my talk. Uh, many thanks for listening. Okay, so thank you, Ole. Uh, so thanks again. Uh, uh, now uh, we basically have a lunch break and we'll come back after one hour. Okay, Ole, we'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you. See you. See you.